So these are the topics I want to actually go through. Recycling, refurbishment, reuse of S&C is specifically part of this, but there's a bit more to it than just that title. What is the circular economy? We've heard a lot of people talk about it, but I think it's worthwhile just spending a few minutes just actually looking at, for those people who aren't familiar with it, what actually does it mean? Why is it different to have a circular economy than a linear economy? We'll talk about that. Bit of rail production, bit of information about what we're doing CO2 level-wise in terms of the tools that we've got within the TA that we're looking to try and actually get the audience out in network rail as a whole and in the uh, wider domain about what CO2 emissions we are sort of creating through the supply chain, the type of CO2 we're trying to actually reduce. Plain line track renewals, built CO2 on that. So we're looking away from S2C specifically, we're looking at rail mainly, but we'll just go into that a little bit details. Going a little bit further into the new sleeper types that we might be looking at, obviously going on from what William's presentation was earlier about the composites. And then the bigger picture. So, quick bit of exercise for everybody. Can everybody stand up, please? If you've, if you've not heard of Whitemore as a recycling centre, can you sit down? If you're aware that there's an SSC recycling facility at Whitemore, stay stand up. So, anybody who doesn't know that there's an SSC recycling facility at Whitemore, please sit down. Quite a few people do. That's useful to know because of what I'm going to go on to. So please sit down. Thank you very much for that. Just a bit of a straw poll, really, to try and understand what people's knowledge and understanding is of what I'm going to talk about. So this is a very old slide in terms of the actual data from Whitemore 2016, 2017, about what type of volumes they recycle. And obviously, it's talking about rail. It's talking about ballast, and sleepers. And they do switches and crossings, as I'm trying to allude to. So there's quite some high numbers there, obviously, from that year. Um, hopefully, that's still reflected in where we are now in terms of the volumes that are going through. Whitemore is a site recycling centre. It's not the only centre that has stuff recovered from renewals and uh, scrap, etc., that's actually taken out the track. But it's the biggest one, actually, for recycling this type of material. So... This is the issue that I'm just going to talk about in terms of where we are with looking at how we can recover s &C and start looking at reusing it and cascading, which is obviously a term that people maybe used. When I started joining the, the railway, people were talking about, oh, yeah, we used to transpose rail. We used to actually take it from one site and take it to another site. We seem to have lost our way a little bit in that sense at the moment, and we need to start thinking about that. As it says there, we generally, as a rule of thumb, two to 300 units of s &C are renewed every year. That might change in volumes depending on the, uh, the CP6, CP7 volumes at numbers, so that may actually vary a little bit, but that's an average. We could you reuse, we could refurbish some of these switch and crossing units by actually bringing them back to Whitemore to get them to actually assess whether they're actually capable of being taken to another site and actually used again. We might need to actually need to do some work on them to actually make sure that they can ensure that they're serviceable, they've got the actual um, standards in place that we know we need to test these rails to make sure that a TME or someone actually might need a, a replacement. Got the assurance, really, it's not going to them with defects that have actually been left in it from where it's been taken out of track. So there's quite a few things that Whitemore can look at to make sure that's possible. So, as an example, that's a 2020 figure for the actual AMS crossings that we actually changed. Some of those might be strategic spares. I couldn't actually get the actual breakdown of the figures, but that's a massive number of crossings, for example, we take out of track. This is a sobering slide. Whitemore opened in 2011. Big fanfare of actually we can recycle this, that, and the other, all the actual componentry I talked about earlier on. But clearly, over the years, it's just declined in S&C recoveries. It's got to the point that I rang them up on Monday just to get some figures for this year. For recoveries, they've had one cast crossing and six half sets of switches, which were actually unused. So it's appalling as far as actually the use of the actual centre we've got for recycling switches and crossings and making sure we can refurbish them. They've got all the facilities to do that, but clearly we're not doing that as a renewal organisation with the actual um, alliances. Maintenance, maybe not so much, but with the alliances themselves, it's looking at how we can actually turn that around because clearly there's an awful lot of wastage going on out there. So 
talking to some of the alliances, I go to a track delivery review group, um, and they talk basically about renewals. It's more about all of those sort of uh, topics. And these are the sort of issues that they've come up with as to why they don't actually recover things. Partly, there's obviously possession constraints. They don't want to actually get any additional costs because clearly the margins they're working to as a contractor are quite fine, and clearly they can't afford to actually have these fines that actually are imposed, and then it drains on their um, profit margins, I suppose. It's seen as difficult to do. Well, actually, they're scrapping out the stuff at the moment, not being very careful about it. They just chuck it in the back of a wagon, and it goes off to one of the centres to actually be scrapped, and it's sold for that scrap value, which really is a very quite high um, quality steel. So theoretically, if we actually use that steel in future to try and actually make sure we give it back to our manufacturers of rail, they can melt it down and actually use a, a fair percentage of that to actually remake rail for us. So it's recycling that steel and actually just throwing it into a, a skip that gives it to a scrap merchant who makes maybe, I don't know, railings for, for roads out of it, something like that. Recovery is not considered at the planning stage. They've got to the stage where they've obviously got trains to book, they've got to understand the plant and machinery they need to actually um, make sure they've got for doing this sort of work. They've got plant and machinery obviously in place already for actually scrapping the stuff out. It doesn't take too much in my mind, and maybe to look at it a bit simplistically, of looking at how we can plan and taking things out a bit more carefully to recover them to somewhere like Whitemoor, they can then assess them rather than the person actually on track assessing them, taking that all away from actually having that um, responsibility as such, and getting that back to Whitemore. They can assess whether it's actually worthwhile repairing and re, re actual refurbishing and making it available for us for actually using in maintenance potentially. There's a potential perception, really. I mean, one of the challenges that came back to me was what's the incentive for us to actually do it? They want to actually say, well, is it going to be a case that we actually get some more money off the actual um, cost of, of buying some of our equipment that we actually put in track? There's obviously various different areas where an incentive is one thing that, if we're looking at actually being more environmentally friendly, there's a big incentive there, but clearly they're not looking at that particular aspect because clearly there's more to it from their perspective on a commercial point of view. So there's some barriers for us to break down. And the perceived machinery equipment cost, which I've talked about. That's a set of SNC I used for a particular project, which I'm not going to talk about, but it was basically a situation where those switches were cut too short. They were brand new, they'd been in track for about three weeks. I'm not going to go into that, what I thought about that, but that's basically the sort of value of, of assets we're just throwing away without actually doing any consideration about the bigger picture. So that's the sort of capabilities that Whitemore has at the moment. It can do all of those things. So there's obviously lots of capabilities that they can actually help people. They do supply a lot of emergency spares, especially when it comes to crossings. We've got a huge stock of new crossings at Whitemore at the moment, really down to actually emergency situations that TMEs find themselves in. First port of call is Whitemore to try and understand if they've got something they can actually supply at very short notice. The biggest problem, obviously, is the lead times of anything that's brand new. So clearly, if we've got stocks of certain more standardised um, components, then Whitemore's got a great presence for TMEs particularly when they're in a problem, or even looking at actually things that we can actually use for a renewal in future. So the other thing that Whitemore have actually started doing, they've supplied a, I think it's an A-switch panel for the actual yard that they're in, or they built it up, they made it, and shipped it across obviously to the yard to actually put in track. So there's a small capability for building things that we actually we can use in areas like signings. So this is the sort of thing we could actually achieve if we actually looked at recoveries. Footprint obviously is a, a, a given. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Obviously spare components. I've talked about emergency situations where obviously people do call on Whitemore at times to get them out of a problem if they can help out. The lead time for class crossing sometimes in some cases it's 52 weeks. And obviously there's a big problem there for the TME. What am I going to do to fill that hole I've got because I've got an emergency situation to fill? Cascaded renewals from recoveries we can actually achieve. Obviously there's lots of possibilities there. There's some obviously caveats in terms of the capacity at Whitemore. There's obviously a limit to what they can actually do and what they can store. 
But if we've got bespoke components, which obviously are, are even more difficult to get people to actually uh, make in a short lead time, then there's obviously a benefit there as well. Um, potentially, we could reduce train delay minutes by actually looking at the strategic options that Whitemore might provide. So this is just what I wanted to talk about in terms of people's perception of what the circular economy means. Obviously, it's talking about end-to-end -end life, but actually reusing it and starting again with that component to actually stop us trying to actually reinvent the actual wheel, excuse the pun, but actually moving back to reusing that material. Instead of at the moment, in linear economy, we have quite often still the case. It's actually something that's made, it's used, it's either worn out or no longer wanted, and it's actually binned. So that's the quick difference between the two. So... As a business, Network Rail is clearly trying to step up to the, the mark where we possibly can do to reduce our footprint. It's a huge challenge, but we've got to do our bit for the environment. It's a corporate responsibility, but I think from a personal point of view, it's personal responsibility. Because people talk about Net Rail's doing this, Net Rail's doing that. Actually, people within Network Rail are making those decisions. It's not the company. We've got standards, and we actually talk to each other, and we talk about what's the possible best option to go for. But... Uh, in essence, it's people making those decisions. Put this picture in basically just to give a, an overview of, well, how much energy is actually put into re, uh, manufacturing rail. So this is from Scunthorpe's steel yard. Scunthorpe's got a, obviously quite an old method of actually producing rail. They use, um, to, to produce the steel, sorry, they use a blast furnace, which is quite heavy in terms of CO2 footprint. If you're talking about, on average... Um, our carbon tool, which I'll talk about in a moment, it's basically saying that the carbon footprint per kilometre of rail is about 3, 300,000 kilograms of CO2. If we move to a different technology, which only one of our suppliers has currently got, which is an electric arc furnace, that is reduced by about six, to a sixth, sorry, so it's about 50,000 kilograms of CO2 per kilometre of rail. Massive difference, but obviously there's a big um, requirement in terms of developments for these rail suppliers and steel makers to make that transition. It's a massive problem because the cost of changing from a blast furnace is quite expensive in terms of millions, um, but obviously it's an area where we need to make sure, if we can, we ought to have a strategy within NetRail's purchasing system that we look at more favourably in terms of manufacturers that use that sort of technology to help us reduce our carbon footprint. So just wanted to put this diagram together, really, of looking at how we need to calculate and factor in everything that we're talking about when it comes to managing and manufacturing rail. So clearly, we start off with the iron ore. That could come from wherever. It could be Australia, even, because obviously they've got quite a, a large uh, uh, supply of iron ore. It needs transporting. If it's coming from abroad, probably a ship's the thing that actually is transporting it to the UK. You've then got other ingredients that goes to the steel making. Um, and then you've obviously got how to transport that from one place to another, back to the steel maker that actually is going to turn it into rail, then to our S&C supplier. He's obviously got to put um, his factor on actually building that and making it into what we want as switches or crossings. Then it's got to be moved to, to site, and then we obviously have the installation. So those figures there are just a, an average of an F turnout, talking about 48,000 kilograms of CO2 for the rail only. I'm not talking about the whole system. So that's the sort of volumes we're talking about, even for an average switch. It's quite eye-opening to look at those figures. So we've got a carbon tool that's been developed from the RSSB's carbon tool. So uh, a guy called Mark Bradbury is looking after this in the technical authority for us. But there's some figures there you're looking at how we can actually consider where we can actually change in terms of whether we use concrete sleepers, bearers, to composites, what the difference is in those sort of figures. If we actually then move away from uh, a blast furnace to an electric arc furnace in terms of supply of, of the rail and how the manufacturing process can be changed. So you've got quite a lot going on there. If we recycle or reuse some of our SNC components, that factor is taken out of the equation. We've still got to basically have the transportation of getting it to site, taking the stuff out that's already in. But that basically saves that volume of CO2. So there's a big incentive in terms of the planet and being more environmentally friendly in terms of looking at how we can achieve that by reusing and looking at assessing our SSC that's taken out the track and making sure we get the best out of that asset rather than actually just scrapping it when it's got life left in it. 
So if we look at a concrete stir now, we've got obviously 48,000 there, there are about kilograms of CO2 for a turnout. Obviously, it'll vary depending on the switch, the turnout itself. But if out of those two or 300 units we are taking out of track every year, we've got maybe up to 100 that could be reused, then that's a huge saving in half a million kilograms of CO2 per year, potentially, or even more. It depends, obviously, on what actual uh, volumes we can have and taking, taking these components out and looking at whether we can reuse them. So moving on to William's um, presentation a little bit. Obviously, there's some background in terms of composite sleepers. Uh, there's a bit of a history, which I think more or less repeats some of what William's already talked about. Um, obviously, it's work in progress in terms of actually getting the uh, other areas in the country to start looking at these in, in terms of renewals rather than actually just um, spot receiving. So there's obviously challenges there in terms of, of getting this to actually be um, usable from a, a delivery perspective, which is working, I think, work in progress in terms of renewals itself. But again, if you're looking at some figures in terms of com composites compared to concrete, you've got that um, comp comparison there where we're actually saving quite a lot of CO2 by using the composite sleepers. It isn't necessarily the only answer, but it's an example of what you can achieve by using those. So clearly there's some big advantages for us as we start going forward with looking at how we can actually get the best out of composite sleepers in future. We're obviously looking at other areas as well. So there's composite sleepers is one thing. We obviously, as a, a company, we've got to look a bit broader in terms of technology and what's out there at the minute. So reducing CO2 in terms of emissionitious contact within concrete barriers at the moment is obviously a big factor for us because of the actual uh, way we actually supply sleepers at the moment in terms of for high speed and high tonnage. Making sure that obviously we've got some circularity where we possibly can, composite sleepers we can actually use in that sense, so we know we can take them out, reuse them again in terms of the actual material. There's one that's actually we're looking at at the moment to go and have a look at a factory in Belgium from a company called Theotrack. They've got a thing called the Sulfur Sleeper, which I went and had to a look at this at Innotrans, and I think there's one or two in the audience probably seen it as well. It's not a case where people think it's sulfur, hmm, rotten eggs and all that type of smell that you actually associate with sulfur. Um, not advocating people go around smelling sleepers just to see if they can actually make the difference or not. It's not exactly the right thing to be doing, but those darker green sleepers that you can see in the left-hand picture, they're those, sleep, those um, sleepers that actually made more of sulfur. So the cementitious content in the cement is more replaced by sulfur. And you think, well, okay, what advantage is that going to give us? Well, I didn't know anything about sulfur and its properties before talking to this company. Apparently, if you heat sulfur up to 114 degrees, it becomes a liquid. So we don't need water. We obviously need heat. And then we can actually turn around and mould it into what sleepers we want. The beauty about that particular product, potentially, I mean, we need to actually understand a bit more about it. Once we've got to a sleeper or a bearer that's come to its end of its life, we can take it back to the factory, heat it up again, remould it into another bearer, and out it goes again. So we're not actually getting any more material. We're just using what we've already got. So theoretically, it's a big win for all of us. You're talking maybe 30, 40 years ahead in terms of actually having that process being available because clearly they're going to last a long time in track provided they actually give the same performance as concrete sleepers. So potentials there. There's obviously options for us to think about and clearly next year I think there's some tenders will be going out for composite sleepers and looking at composite bearers as well. So there's work going on in TA to get those... Um, documentations together for the specifications that we're actually asking for. And lastly, I think with what we're talking about here in terms of moving forward with actually recycling, reusing our track components from a, an SNC rail perspective, it's, it's that ripple effect. I think we obviously look at things in isolation sometimes and think, okay, doing that, recovering that SNC, what difference is that going to make? But clearly, if we start actually looking at it from a point of view of it's our bit that we can actually contribute. It's our corporate responsibility and personal responsibility to actually see that through and push it forward. The ripple effects, obviously, we've all seen Blue Planet on the TV, those that are obviously interested in watching it. It speaks for itself. I'm not going to go into, obviously, raising sea levels and all that type of thing. It's all in the papers. It's all in the press about all of this sort of thing. So let's stop the reluctance to change and let's grasp that nettle and make sure we can actually get through all these 
problems that we actually can highlight that we need to actually resolve. Thank you very much.